one two one two okay good so as you realize like this mic doesn't enhance the volume we're going to be loud enough by ourselves but this is for recording purposes so people can watch us later on the internet and hear what we have to say and all the intelligent opinions that you're going to add to what the the expert the knowledge keeper is going to share with us so i'm tommy uh thanks for being here quite a quite a few new faces today thank you for making it they told me like the the train is sort of delayed and stuff so that is even more important that you're here this is darker music talks um what is this simply we bring an expert a knowledge keeper every month and we have a discussion with musicians or music related people so we can see what we can learn how we can make you know this music world a little bit better and how we can learn how to be entrepreneurs like this is the ultimate point right everything has to do a little bit with business how we can think as a businessman um this is your stage right so i'm i'm just here to bring you all together and now i want to hear from you so we can make this an interactive thing so it's not going to be just michael he knows a lot but he's not going to be just talking and talking and talking i want to have an opinion you know and then this interactivity so feel free whenever you want to say something that's the only rule here there are no rules but please get the mic and talk in front of this weird thing so we can record the volume, all right? Um, that's it. Um, if you want to tweet and not pay attention while Michael is talking, you better do that. But you can use darker music talks on a hashtag and, and take a picture and say what, how you feel about this. Yeah. And uh, make sure nice because the big, big brother is watching. Uh, okay. Right, yes, yes, you don't see them. Um, that's it, and let's get started, and thanks for being here. Awesome. It's so great to be here, guys. Um, you know when you walk into the room and you feel the energy of the room, and you either like being there or you don't? Like, as soon as I walked in, I'll be honest with you, Hackney's not my usual neighborhood, <laughs> right? Anything outside of zone one is, I'm like, do I need a passport, right? <laughs> So I'm a little bit of a diva in that sense. And I was coming with my best friend, Arthur. We were in the tube and we were like, what the fuck? Where, where are we going? You know? I was like, don't worry, it's going to be fine. I'm sure Tony uh, ran his things only in a nice, uh, Tommy ran his things only in nice places. So it's a lovely venue. You guys have great energy. So I'm very excited to be here. Now, how did I get to, to sit where I'm sitting right now? There's the guy called Tony sitting over there who's been following my work um, all the way since 2011, I think. So when I first started as a coach, I also used to run lots of uh, talks, lots of events myself. Sorry for starting without you, but I've only said hi, so <laughs> come join us. Um, one of the things I was doing, I was running lots of talks. So at, at the peak, I was, I was giving uh, up to six talks a week. The only reason I, I wasn't speaking on Saturday because I figured that nobody wants to come. So. I would, I would try to do something on a Saturday evening, nobody came. I was like, maybe because people have better things to do on a Saturday night than, than going to listen to some Polish guy talking about personal development. <laughs> so I just stick to you know, Sunday to Friday talks. And I was relentless. And I started to do it for free, then I was doing it donation only, two pounds per talk, five pounds per talk, 10 pounds per talk. And Tony was one of these people that, there was a point where I was thinking, is he stalking me? You know, Because he was there all the time. And I was like, I'm a nice guy, but like I see this guy a bit too often, maybe you know. So, and then uh, Tony came to one of the talks. I was giving a similar talk to a group of entrepreneurs um, a few weeks ago. Tony was there, and then he put me in touch with Tommy. Tommy came to my place for the coffee, and there was an instant connection there. Um, and then he told me about this, and I could feel how passionate he is about helping musicians. So. Um, I, I figured quite quickly that there might be no money involved for me of being here, right? And, and I'm a coach, but I'm also a businessman. So but I very quickly asked him, what's in it for me? Like, you know, nice, you're a nice guy, but what's in it for me? And he told me, well, you can promote whatever you want to promote, but there's no guarantee. And I said, you know, I'm, I would help you anyway. I would do it anyway because I like you. And I will always try to support people with the vision. And... And I will tell you my story so you will understand why music is close to me as well. So I'm not a musician, but I almost became a musician. So I will tell you that in a minute. So I have two intentions for tonight. One is, the first one is to inspire you, to inspire you with my personal story. 
uh, you know, to tell you where I came from and where I am right now. And my second intention is to uh, give you some information to educate you. When I say educate you, sound a little bit patronized, like I'm not fucking educate you, but like I wanna I wanna give you some information that you can actually go out there and use. It's not just inspiration. I don't want you to just leave this room inspired, and you're gonna feel inspired till uh, Monday, and then what? You know. So I want you to leave with something you can actually apply, or something that you're gonna think about, and that something that's gonna change your life. And even if one person here will will change something in their lives by 5% as a result of me being here, my job is done. I really don't expect all of you to take so much out of it and just change your lives and like, you know, sending me Christmas cards from this year to the rest of your life, you know? That would be great, I don't mind that. I'll give you the address. Right, so, guys, I have, uh, I've always been a maverick. From a very young age, I would, I would rebel against the rules. I would always do things my way and I remember my mom um, has met one of my teachers from primary school recently, and this teacher said to I don't remember that I was a kid, but this teacher said to my mom that Michael, that I was a person who would never do anything unless I wanted to do it. Like, you can't force me to do something if I don't want to do it. So then, sure enough, I was, I was exceptionally good in primary school without doing anything, just using my, I guess, intelligence. And then I got to one of the best high schools in my city in Poland, uh, which is one of the biggest cities, and and I was like, I'm bored. I'm bored of the, out of my ass. This is not for me. And I got into art, into music already. I was in a music school playing trumpet because I wanted to be a trumpet player. And, and there was this point, I was 17. I was sitting in the class, third year, and you know, first subject of the day. And I remember like it was yesterday, and I was you know, 14 years ago, but I remember like it was yesterday. I remember sitting there thinking, OK, uh, the bell will ring, I will leave the school and never come back. That's exactly what happened. So I quit school when I was 17. And guys, quitting school in Poland is not the same as quitting school, uh, school here. Because when you look at Brownson, when you look at uh, Alan Sugar, it's kind of cool, all oh, big entrepreneurs, they quit school. Nobody quits school in Poland. Unless you're a total moron, you just don't do it. Because the whole country is based on education. So you can imagine the reactions of my parents. <laughs> who, uh, who were certain I'm going to be a doctor, a lawyer, or whatever. And I was certain myself. But that just wasn't for me. And looking back, and when you think about it, you can only really judge the experience from the future. So looking back, I can tell you that was one of the best decisions I've ever made. So, so I quit regular school. I was still in the music school. So I was playing trumpet. And the idea was to be, uh, you know, white Miles Davis, right? Because if you aim for something, you, you might as well aim high. As Donald Trump says it, uh, you're going to be thinking anyway, you might as well think big. So I was like, okay, if I'm, if I'm doing this shit, I'm going to be the best. And there's just no other way, you know? So, come on, guys. Ah, I recognize this man. Uh, hi, Pablo. Um, so I thought, okay, I'm going to do this. So I'm going to do it properly. And I remember first year of the school was six-year school. And there was an exam. So even though my passion was jazz, it was a classical music school. There was no jazz schools in my city. So I was doing jazz with the guys in the basement, you know, smoking weed and playing jazz, you know. It's the best time of my life. And uh, it was a classical school, and there was an exam coming, the end of the year exam. And, uh, and I, was, I, was practicing, I was practicing my piece. It was a very simple piece. And there was this point where I had to play this very high-pitched sound, and I couldn't. So... I just couldn't. I, have a, I had a physical difficulty of, of, of doing that. And I remember very well because the, the day of exam came and I was there all nervous playing this, playing this, this part. And I, you know, I spent so many hours rehearsing it. And everything was fine until it came, it came the time of playing that very high note. And I failed miserably. I just couldn't reach it. I said, OK, Michael, could you leave the room for us? And it was like free professors there sitting, you know, imagine Poland, to the year 2000, and just like a very serious, you know. So I left the room, my heart was beating like this. Okay, they, they called me back, and I, and I look at them. You could cut the tension in the room with a knife. Everybody was like this. So I'm standing there, nobody wants to say anything. And of course I knew what's going to happen, because I just blew it, right? And then my trumpet uh, teacher said, Michael, uh, I have some bad news for you. And I'm, and I'm like, look, like, look at my body language, because that's how I felt, you know. 
I felt tears come into my eyes. I was like, I'm not going to be a pussy. I'm not fucking crying here, right? In front of those fucking guys. So, okay, so they told me the news. I left the room. I went to the toilet and I cried like a baby. But then I thought to myself this. Miles Davis is dead. Who is the best trumpet player alive? And at that time, I don't know about now, I don't follow jazz that much, but at that time, the best trumpet player was Tomasz Stanko, who is a Polish uh, trumpet player, big Polish jazz uh, uh, character. So I was like, okay, since Miles Davis is dead, I can't talk to him. I'm going to find that guy, go and talk to him. If he tells me there's a hope, I will keep pursuing it. If he tells me there's no hope, I will never touch the trumpet again. Because they told me, Michael, you can, you can, you can play, but... It, it's, you're just always going to struggle with this high pitch. And, and, you know, when you think about trumpet, it's all about the high pitch. That's where the emotions are. Um, so I found this guy, you know, he was living on the other side of the country in Warsaw, and I don't remember how I found his address. I took my friend. He said, you want to come with me? He said, yeah, I'm going with you. The guy who used to play, who used to play um, double bass, we were playing on the street, you know, jazz. And he went with me. And I remember this journey. I got to the guy's house, and... and um, I said, okay, play the sound. I took this, opened the suitcase, I played the sound. He was like, forget about it. There's just, there's something wrong with you. And I remember, you know, naively I've asked him if, if I could do a plastic surgery, and he just laughed. So that was the last time I touched the trumpet. So, but then when I discovered coaching at the age of 27, and, and now looking back, I, I know why I couldn't play the trumpet, because yes, I wanted to impact lots of people through trumpet, through music, but now I see that I can impact even more people through what I do right now. Yeah? So only after 27 years when I discovered coaching, I understood why I couldn't play trumpet. So going back a little bit, I quit school when I was 17, struggled with different kinds of jobs, was going through periods of no money or lots of money. I was always quite entrepreneurial. I've always been very good in making money. The only problem is I've always been even better in spending money so it's a family thing that we have, you know. We always go for the most expensive items in the shop, and we always uh, spend a lot. Uh, but I've always been very entrepreneurial. I've always had more money than my peers. But these five years before coming to London at the age of 22, uh, you know, big ups and then big downs. So when I came to London, I, was, I came on a down. So I came without money. I spent 27 hours on the bus journey because I couldn't afford the plane ticket. And not only I came without money, I also came with a high maintenance girlfriend. So I was in a serious trouble, right? I wasn't just fucked, I was double fucked. So we came here 27 hours in a, in a bus, and I had a lovely couple of friends living here at the time, because if not them loaning us money, uh, I mean, we couldn't come, because my parents never had money, and I didn't have any money at the time. None of my friends had money back in Poland, so they allowed us to come, and. And we spent the first two weeks in London in New Cross on the squat in the little room, the four of us. Um, so that was a very, very humble beginning. So looking for a job and getting the first job, spending the first five years in retail, building my way up to the, to the kind of managerial position and, and having a very successful career there. But it, it was an example of, of winning in the wrong game. And I always say to people, the fact that you're good at something, it doesn't necessarily mean that you should do it. Because all of you here, you're smart people. You can go to the bank and be good at it. But how much are you going to love your life? You're going to fucking hate it. Like, I would hate working in a bank. My banker clients love it, you know? So it's, you know, I say you would hate it because, you know, you are art artists, right? Um, so then when I was 27, I discovered coaching. And just the same way I felt about trumpet at the age of, at the age of 16, 17, that's how I felt about coaching. I just knew it. Like my whole body was telling me that this is something I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing. Now, can you really say that you do something and you know for certain this is going to be something you're going to do for the rest of your life? Of course not. It doesn't matter. If I wake up tomorrow and I want to be an astronaut, guess what? I will be pursuing astronaut career. doesn't matter. But, you know, as long as you feel it today, then you just pursue it. So um, I just felt very strongly that this is it. And, um, you know, I started very small. Like every, I always say to coaches, the best coaches out there start with the first client. Yeah, and, and kind of to relate that to what you do, you know, the best bands started with a little shitty geek in a little shitty pub in the worst part of town. Yeah? 
they didn't play Apollo first or Wimbledon, or not Wimbledon, Wembley. Right? When you think about it, it's like, yeah, but like, you no, know, but when you go back, you will see a, f a first client paying very little money or no money for a coach and shitty little path for a musician, right, or a band. But it's very easy to forget that when you look at the big stars out there thinking, oh my God, it must have been easy for them. But what I've been always doing, I was studying the stories of successful people, not just other coaches, not just musicians when I was playing music. I was always fascinated with success and why some people are successful and some are not. And one of the things I've discovered is that it's not about intelligence, it's not about the background, it's not about the nationality, none of this kind of external stuff. It's not about the height for a guy or whatever. Um, started very small, 20 pounds an hour from my first clients. And then as my confidence was growing, I was charging 50 pounds an hour, 75 pounds an hour. So every few months, right now I charge up to 1,000 pounds an hour. And I'm not saying that to impress you, I'm saying that to impress upon you. Because my first job in the UK, when I was 18, when I came here just for a few months, was two pounds an hour. And it occurred to me, I was thinking to myself, I have no education whatsoever. I'm not even qualified as a coach. I have no qualification whatsoever. I just don't like the system. I don't like the education system. I like to learn things by myself. So my parents never had money. I came here with almost no English, right? from Eastern Europe, and there's a little bit of a complex related to Eastern Europe, when people come, it's like, oh, I'm from Eastern Europe, and this is Western world, and that's all bullshit, I always say to them. So it occurred to me, it's like, how interesting is that? I can go from two pounds an hour to thousand pounds an hour, doing something that absolutely, two pounds an hour for something I absolutely fucking hate, to thousand pounds doing something I absolutely fucking love with people that absolutely adore my clients. How interesting is that? And because I know where I came from, I think, and I'm convinced about that, that if I could do it, anybody can do it. Because I'm not smarter than anybody here. I'm more arrogant than most of you here, probably. <laughs> so if you think I'm arrogant, it's, 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 you're not, you don't hallucinate, yeah? I am just a little bit arrogant, you know? I've always been like that. So I came here without money, but I came here with a very strong, uh, with very big hunger, with a very big attitude. On this bloody bus for 27 hours, I was thinking, I'm going to go there, I'm just going to dominate. So I didn't know the industry yet. I, I knew I'm going to find the right industry. I'm just going to do whatever. And whatever job I'm going to get, whether it's going to be a pub or a shop, I'm going to be the best. So when I, get, when, I, when I went for the first interview, age of 22, for the retail shop, I remember having this interview with this guy. And he was like, oh, what are your plans here in this company? And I looked him straight in the eye and I said, I want your job as soon as possible. And he laughed, obviously. And then after nine months, I took over his position and he wasn't laughing anymore. So it's just, I always say, it's, it's, it's the attitude is the most important thing. You know, the hunger. Because you see, I was already, as a sales assistant in that shop, I was acting like a manager. I was bossing people around a little bit. I was showing my... My, my boss is that I'm ready for this position. And then when I was a 20 pounds an hour coach, I was acting like a 50 pounds an hour coach. And then I was, when I was 50 pounds an hour, I was acting like a 100 pounds an hour coach. You know, so for you here, it's, no matter what stage you at, you want to consider acting like you are doing better than you're already doing. So people can see you as doing better than you're doing, so they can give you more responsibility, they can give you better geeks, whatever. Because ultimately, people will think about you what you think about yourself. I think, if you haven't figured that yet, I think very highly about myself. And I don't do fucking false modesty. No, I'm not modest. I've tried this modesty thing a few times. It doesn't work for me. So I'm not trying anymore. I'm not, I love myself. But because I love myself so much, it's bloody easy for me to love other people. And because it's very easy for me to love other people, it's quite easy for them to love me, kind of, you know, to get get on with me, because my ego is just not there interfering with the relationship. You approach people very differently from a place of like, I don't want really anything from you. Let's just have a good time or whatever. Let's just talk business or let's just have a nice conversation, you know. So studying all the successful people and, and kind of become successful myself in different areas of my life. Um, I, 
I think about myself, and it's very hard to kind of tell, but I see myself as a top 1% in my industry in, in, uh, in the UK right now, which is, you know, you guys won't know about me, but I'm quite well known within my industry as a guy who's made a six-figure business in two and a half years, which is unheard of uh, in the coaching industry. Coaches are known for not making money. <laughs> coaches are known for just being plenty of them and not making any money, you know? And there's this fucking guy just saying, I'm going to make lots of money from coaching, and this is exactly what happened. So I got a book out uh, last year that has been very well received. Uh, it, it's there at the back. Um, the most exciting thing in my business right now is I, we, I've partnered with a very senior TV director on shooting a pilot of a TV show where I basically run my signature six-week transformation program in front of the camera, having the camera crew following the client between sessions. So we have already done four sessions out of six. The guy is already transformed. I'm coaching, which is great, because if she wasn't, I would be, be in trouble. So I'm like, I need to get this one right. And uh, she's doing very well already, and we have it all documented, and it's still not finished. So as soon as this is done, so sometime this month, we're going to finish the shooting it. Then they probably will take a month to edit it, and then from September, we're going to try to get it commissioned. If that's going to get commissioned, you might see my face uh, more than you want to on a TV channel there somewhere. So my two big goals when it comes to my industry is number one, um, this one won't surprise you at all, is to become the number one life coach in the UK. Not number two, not top five, top ten. I'm not interested in top two. Number one is the only goal. And... As I said to my PR agency, there's nothing I'm not prepared to do to get there except for sleeping with the men. So that, <laughs> that, that's when I draw the line. Everything else, just throw it at me. You know, I can handle it, I'm sure. And it's funny because were, I was saying that to someone in front of my other coach friend, and he said, I don't have this rule, by the way. Like, I, don't, I can even go that far. So, okay, just you can do whatever you want. Um, so that's very exciting. So that's, that's one goal. Number two is... You know, I'm very passionate about my industry. I'm very passionate about coaching. I, you know, I saw hundreds of people transforming in front of my eyes. I saw another hundreds of people transforming in front of working with my other coaches' friends. So I'm not saying I'm the only one who can transform someone. Uh, just coaching is just so powerful. And the problem is, it could be my mom. The problem is, tell her I'm okay. The problem is that uh, not many people know about it. And even those that do know about it, if they don't know much about it, they might think, what is this life coaching? It sounds a little bit airy-fairy. It sounds a little bit weird. It sounds a little bit Californian, you know. And because I do it every day for the last four years and, you know, I see the results that are taking place, I can tell you there's nothing airy-fairy about it. But I can tell you, I say, of course he says that because he's, I mean, he's making money doing it. So, of course, he's going to say that. But if you watch what we're recording right now, every single one of you will say, this is so straightforward. There's no difference between this and having a personal training in the gym. And I said, that's what I always say. <laughs> you know, coaching came from, life coaching came from sport coaching. The same way sport coaches help athletes is the same way I help my clients, you know. And I work with some, the most successful people you can think of. They don't have problems, really. They don't have issues. They just want to add 10%, 20% to their performance, whatever they do. Or, or you know, they want to improve their happiness by 20%. I'm not a therapist, you know, coaching is not a therapy. So, so what I've learned, you know, study, studying the successful people and, and, you know, being really kind of enthusiastic and uh, into success and what makes certain people successful, what I've, I don't want to say I've discovered it because it sounds like I, I've, you know, nobody has discovered that. What I've noticed is that success in just about any area is down to three elements. So I would like to go one by one and, and, and elaborate on these three elements. Number one is the passion. To have passion for whatever you want to be successful at. And I don't think that anybody in this room lacks passion for music. Because there's so many other things you could do right now. Uh, and somehow you've chosen to be here. So that tells me that you are serious. Music or, or, or whatever, you know, something maybe related to music or some, for, some form of art, or whatever it is, right? So I say that when people come to me, it's, it's very hard for me to coach them on becoming more passionate. Because if, you if you're not passionate, I'm not going to make you passionate. It's like somebody coming to me saying, can you make me fall in love with my wife? I'm going to say, no, I can't. I can help you get divorced and find a new one, 
But how can I make you love something or someone? Of course I can't do it. Um, so that's number one element. And of course, um, there are different levels of, of being passionate. And what I find in my experience, like the most successful I become, the better results I generate about in, in, in one particular area, the more passionate I tend to become about this area. Because results feeds this level of passion. You know, it's easier to be passionate about something if that produces results, whether it's money or recognition or whatever, sex, if you just improve your dating life. Um, so the passion is number one. Number two is something I call hustle muscle. So it's all about um, working hard. Right now I work 10 to 15 hours a week, and if you would follow me with the camera, you'd think, fucking hell, what a lifestyle he has. Like, he doesn't do much. Yeah, but that's now. But when I first started, I was working seven days a week for two and a half years without holidays, seeing my one-to-one -one clients, running five, six talks a week, coming back home, my ex-girlfriend was waiting with a dinner, I had a dinner, talking to her a little bit, sitting on my computer, her complaining, me dealing with her complaining about me, working. But it's, I was like, honey, you have to understand. I just have to do it, you know? Like, nobody could take, nobody could stop me. I just felt like that. I was building this foundation. So now the foundation is built, so I'm a little bit more relaxed. So I added a little bit more spice to my life. You know, I started to go out again. I don't work weekends anymore because I don't have to. And whatever decisions I make now are on a kind of higher level. So instead of running free talks six times a week, I'm, you know, I'm doing a TV show. Instead of uh, writing little articles, I'm writing books. So it's just, I'm still working a lot, I would say, but in a slightly different way. But I always say to coaches that just start, don't try to follow my lifestyle right now because you're not ready for it. You haven't built anything yet. It's, it's, it's important to know when can you take the foot of the accelerator a little bit. So I say, always say initially, you know, you just got to have to work your ass off. There's, there's no other way. You know, don't rely on luck. I say, always say that uh, the harder you work, the luck you get. I don't believe in luck. You look at, uh, I like this example of Matt Damon, who's one of my favorite actors. And they say, oh, he got lucky because he managed to write the script for uh, Good Will Hunting. I don't know how many of you have seen it, one of my favorite movies. And he got lucky, they wrote this script with Ben Affleck, people liked it, they, got, they won an Oscar. you fucking idiot if you think like that. Because if you, if you look at his life, for nine years prior to writing this Oscar-winning script, he was working his ass off as a waiter, doing shitty auditions for no money, and just hassling. So it's an overnight success that took nine years to happen. You won't find one successful person. And I'm not talking about someone who is using, who is a fifth generation property magnet, because obviously the money was always there. But you won't find one person who's really made it big, whether financially or just becoming successful in one way or another, without hard work. And I have to say, you know, you know what they say about Polish people, they work hard, we're taking your jobs. Of course we're taking your jobs, because we prepare to work harder than you. And I say, Michael, but you know, you have this goal of being number one life coach, but what if someone is more talented than you as a coach? Fine, I'm sure there are people more talented than me. But guess what? I'm gonna work when they're on holiday. I'm gonna work when they have sex. I'm gonna work when they watch TV. I'm gonna outwork them. And when it comes to music, Let's face it, how many artists out there have actual talent who, that is, you know, like, like Adele level? That she can sing, I'm, I don't know, I haven't met her. She's on my list of like dream clients, so I'm gonna work with her one day. So I will let you know, you know, after I work with her, after I meet her. But like, I can, I can imagine Adele just entering the room and, and she doesn't need anything. She could just, it's just this talent is, you know. But the rest is just, yeah, just talented people. So why some of them make it, some of them don't? Because the ones that make it just probably work harder. And I work with musicians sometimes, and that's some of my favorite clients. You know, really passionate, like I said, the passion is already there. And I said, listen, you just gotta, you know, you wanna get gigs, you just have to make phone calls. Yeah, but I don't like to make phone calls. Yeah? Working with, working with entrepreneurs, including artists, um, there's something called Avoidance activity. So people keeping themselves busy doing things. 
But you see, it's not about doing things, it's about doing the right things. Yeah, it, it, it's very easy to like, in, in business, number one thing is selling. In, and I, in, in music, well, you gotta sell yourself as well, you know? Selling is so important. We sell all the time. You go on a date, you sell. As a girl, you put a makeup on, you sell. Yeah, we, we kind of, it's, it's like self-promotion. I think about myself as a product. I'm not as cool as Apple yet, but you know, I think about myself as a product. Anything I put on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, it's, I think about it. Like how that's gonna affect my image. I think about myself as a brand. You know, that's, that's, you know, you get to the point where, okay, you become a brand and you have to think about yourself as a brand. Because everything either hurts or helps. Every, everything, every decision that you make, every conversation, that you, every, every picture you post on Instagram. So, avoid this activity. The fact that you're busy and you're tired at the end of the day doesn't mean that you spend this day very productively. Because in the end of the day, it's what, what results have you produced? And you know, as a musician, you might be better off uh, calling, just I'm using just like a first example that came to my mind. You might be better off calling 10 pubs, asking if you can geek, than uh, you know, have another rehearsal with your band playing the same song for the 20th time. Because ultimately, unless you have these geeks, nobody would see you playing those, sorry, those songs that you've perfected already. But what's the problem? The problem is that it's much easier to play the same, rehearse the same song for the 20th time than to pick up the bloody phone. It's much easier. That's why most of people will go and rehearse this song for the 21st time. But you see, most of people don't succeed. So one of the ways to be successful is to look what the majority do and do the opposite. Whether it's dating, whether it's entrepreneurship, whether it's stock market. Most of the people get the wrong stocks and lose money. So you could buy the opposite stocks and make more money. So majority is always wrong. That's why majority is unsuccessful and there's a small percentage, I don't know, let's say 5% of people that are successful in what they do. And the 1% percent, the will be super successful. So guess who do I study? I study the super successful because I want to be like them. And if I do what they do, I will get what they have. It's as simple as that. So most of people in the morning read the fucking Metro and expose themselves to this bullshit, negative, wars and everything. How do you expect yourself to have a happy, great day after exposing yourself to this? I haven't touched Metro in five years, except for one time I had a full page about me. I've read that. Why? Because it doesn't serve my purpose. It doesn't give me anything. But we do it because it's a habit, because it's there. It's like, oh, there's nothing to do. I'm just gonna, oh my God, raping, killings, oh my God, wars everywhere. This is a bad universe. There's so much hatred there. And I love what Einstein said. Einstein said that the biggest decision we have to make in life is to decide whether we live in a friendly or hostile universe. Because depending on what decision we make on that, we will experience either friendly or hostile universe. So now, I don't watch TV, I don't read papers, I surround myself with happy and positive people. Guess what kind of universe I believe I live in? I'm like, I don't need drugs, I'm just like, pff, constantly high. But it's the little choices that we make every day, you know. Am I gonna read Metro, or I'm gonna read the book that actually is gonna make me make more money? or become a better musician, whatever. Am I gonna watch the news? I'm gonna watch a tutorial on YouTube, how to build a social media profile. It's, I know it's easy to watch the news because, because the news suck you in. They are designed like that, they suck you in. Or the metro sucks you in because this, the drama is very, uh, you know, the monkey brain that we have, one of our little brains, loves the drama. And the same, this whole soap operas and all these dramas on TV, you know, they suck you in. But it's too expensive for me. I can't afford it. I can't afford the TV. And it's not because of the price of TV, but because of the time I would lose watching this TV. It's the, one of the most, it's the most expensive thing you can buy after the house. Because the time you're gonna lose by watching it. So as you, as you got it, I'm not, a, I'm not pro TV. Um, so guys, hustle muscle, be a hustler. I'm a hustler. 
If I want something, I will get it no matter what.